for Gabriel, what is the advantage or motivation of using reinforcement learning here instead of supervised learning? Hey, yes. So um, supervised learning may yield better results. I haven't looked into it. Uh, the reason I chose to use uh, double Q learning with a um, experience replay buffer is because um, I was under the impression that deep reinforcement learning uh, comes in the, uh, the advantage comes in the form of it um, learning the um, goal on its own in the form of either uh, penalties or rewards. Whereas with um, supervised learning, um, it is uh, a different mechanism, which I, I was led to believe that, for, le sorry, I was led to believe that for this particular scenario, um, it would yield a, a larger overall um, network that would be more complex and it might get better behavior or it might not, I'm not sure. But um, I did speak briefly about the end goal of being able to port this once it's been trained and then uh, trimmed onto uh, edge hardware, like what you might find on a uh, device in orbit. And with a supervised learning um, scenario, it, I was led to believe it would be more difficult to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would like to follow on with to that question. Uh, that's probably for you and Animesh. Uh, what uh, Animesh talked about was to, to learn policies without doing the trial and error. So is there, is there a possibility to apply that sort of technique in, in this problem? Absolutely. I think, uh, uh, okay, let me back up. Uh, when I say without trial and error, this is slightly different from pure supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning would basically be that you have state and action pairs um, in the data here state and true action pairs here you have state and action pairs and some reward and and you can compute the correct uh, variation or deviation from the uh, suboptimal expert uh, the only difference is because you never actually interact with the environment you can this is why where it would be sandboxed you compute is free you can run however long you want uh, data is expensive. In this case, it would be more interesting to see uh, how much data is available a priori and how much on policy or useful data is available. Completely meaningless uh, random perturbations won't work either. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, let's see, there is from Slido a question also for Gabriel. What is the reward function used and how do you choose it? Um, the reward function, mm, so just a little bit of context, I was warned by my university's um, officer that deals with ITAR restrictions that there were specifics about my project that I can't discuss freely. Um, if you send me an email, I would be happy to check with the office and see what specifically I'm allowed to discuss versus not. Oh, that is an interesting question with regards to ITAR. The ITAR, the ITAR rules were written way before these sort of uh, algorithms were available. So I, I don't know how something falls in, in under ITAR control or not. And that I think depends highly on the institution that you're working at and that particular officer, I think. But fair enough. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, well, since we're on a roll, so another question for Gabriel. You have developed the algorithm on NVIDIA GPU. From power usage point of view, have you considered FPGA acceleration? Uh, yes, it is something I've uh, looked at doing. The, um, the end goal right now, um, uh, I've been training it to get it working on uh, NVIDIA GPUs, but I've been concurrently running a much smaller uh, Q network off of a um, Intel Movidius uh, chip. I've been using a up squared board that comes with one of the uh, Myriad X VPUs and um, seeing how it performs with a 
uh, similarly trained uh, Q network. Thank you. Let's see. There are other questions for uh, other speakers. So to uh, Shrija, um, what are the technologies that need TRL maturation to enable the proposed CONOPS? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we have uh, been focusing on ground-based scheduling for the soil moisture application that I discussed. Um, but any application that needs uh, onboard scheduling, we'd need significant maturation of um, boards that can be used on board that are radiation hardened, as well as communication technologies to allow for the inter-satellite links and um, onboard DTN. Um, all of the modeling that I showed uh, is shows that it is possible to do. However, putting all of those technologies together in a single mission hasn't been demonstrated before. Um, one of the things that is very critical to agile constellations is the ability of the spacecraft to reorient and point in different directions at small notice. Um, attitude control technologies do exist right now and have reoriented spacecraft right from CubeSats up to 100 kilogram satellites. But again, putting this in the loop using onboard scheduling and intersatellite links and combining all of these three into one mission hasn't been demonstrated. So I believe that individually, all the TRLs should be around six, um, but as a mission, using all of them together um, in, in a relevant environment, it'll be a little bit lower. Okay, thank you. And uh, if Florence is available, uh, the, the types of technologies that uh, Shrija mentioned that need TRL maturation, is that on the roadmap, if you will, or um, for, for the SMD to invest in? Not sure. Oh, yeah. yes, so I, I am available. I'm sorry. Um, I am trying to figure out. So, so can you repeat the question again? Because I was uh, ah. kind of listening. Not so there was a question about the types of uh, technologies that need uh, the TRL increase in order for the CONOPS uh, for the, the autonomous uh, planning observations that Shrija mentioned in the talk. And then she mentioned, uh, let's see, the onboard uh, radiation hardened compute platforms and the inter-satellite links as two examples. So, uh, so those technologies are on the roadmap, if there, if there is a roadmap for, for the SND tech office to, to invest in? So, so for that, uh, for that, I um, we th these are cross cutting, you know, where you you're talking about uh, point and flex, uh, uh, point and um, and um, adapt uh, to to targeting. And I know, for example, Esto, uh, the Earth Science Technology Office, is definitely interested in the uh, this kind of uh, uh, workings because the. They are. They they have a new observing strategy that they are planning to, uh, you know, um, roll out for uh, pr predictions and and uh, the fact is that there is uh, work go going on within um, SMD uh, in their AIST program. Uh, that's Advanced Information System Technology Program. We also have. Uh, some work going on within the STMD, the Space Technology Mission Directorate where um, we are definitely looking at inter-satellite links uh, uh, communications. I think Click A, B, C are, are definitely working on, on that kind of, uh, those are missions that are, uh, uh, they are looking into the, uh, those abilities. Uh, so, so all the technologies uh, uh, that, that Srija mentioned will be, um, is, is being um, looked, you know, looked at or invested in, in different, waste. Does that help? And, and if I may add a, a follow-up answer to that, uh, the project I described is being currently funded by ESTO's AIST program. Um, so it's fairly in sync with uh, their interests in investing in observing system simulations that can be run real time in order to schedule these observations. Um, instead of relying completely on GPUs on the Earth that take a couple of days to process data as, as was traditionally uh, known. Uh, and, and SMD uh, through ESTO is also investing in, um, um, as Florence mentioned, uh, these enabling technologies so, and in, in the form of an NOS demonstration in the future. 
um, and I've also worked with, excuse me, with uh, with a mission um, funded by the Game Changing Tech Demo G GCD, I think it is, by STMD, uh, which is funding an AIMS mission called uh, Distributed Spacecraft Autonomy, which uh, is trying to fly a swarm mission that can uh, talk to each other and make decisions. It's not as much a constellation with repointing radars, but um, uh, it, it goes to say that there is various bodies in NASA that are interested in these technologies to, to push it forward in, in future missions. And thank you, Sujha. Certainly, uh, I guess you're talking, I'm aware of that, that mission. I didn't mention the, the you know, uh, game-changing development, uh, but yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And, and also, um, like, you know, you, I think we all are, are kind of targeting the same thing, but AI mm -hmm. is definitely interested, and so is GDC. Game changing GCD. <laughs> so oh, always a mouthful of acronyms. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Shriya and Florence. That's uh, that. There was a question from Ilya Kusovskin that um, was asked on the Q and A, but uh, I think we should raise it here. Uh, so reinforcement learning seems to be crawling out of simulators and games into the real world and it's looking promising as a candidate technology to reach those high levels of robot autonomy we all strive for in this workshop. So which applications, tasks, challenges within the unstructured planetary robotics, uh, I guess, field is the most suited to be addressed next by RL? Ideally, that is some, something that is challenging and solved to unstable using classical robotics approach. Would anyone like to take that. Perhaps. So I, I think I can go if, if, uh, if nobody else is. <laughs> I'd love to hear from others though. Uh, I think one thing that uh, Ilya mentioned was uh, the broad idea of RL starting to work. It is and it is not. We should be very careful. It is not where if you do not have a reasonable simulator or a model of the world, like a, a system where it's completely real world uh, without actually even having a model, is still something that is trickier. There have been instances, but in general trickier. That's one thing to be aware of. That said, if you can have even a reasonable simulator, it does not have to be technically completely correct, just sufficient such that the solution is in the ballpark, uh, you can do a lot with these methods right now. Uh, so that's something that we need to be aware of uh, as these methods evolve. Uh, the advantage primarily of these methods is in generalization, particularly through semantics. So a lot of generalization, of course, can be achieved through conventional techniques. Uh, we have already seen very good performance in, let's say, deep learning plus conventional robots. A very good example would be deep slam kind of family of approaches. Uh, but uh, as soon as we have to solve things where reasoning has to be beyond the low level, which is basically semantics, that is where deep learning methods or learning based methods broadly would eventually win out. I have, this is the part where now I'm opining rather than uh, objective, uh, is uh, there may be short term solutions where we can extend current methods and it may appear that they are winning. Uh, but as we have seen in other areas, uh, for semantics and abstract representations, it would be very hard for conventional hand-tuned or hand-designed methods to uh, to win as both data grows uh, and the problem becomes more complex. Now, what instances of these problems exist in space exploration remains to be seen. I believe they would be beyond uh, pure mobility. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ilya, do you have any follow-up question? Um, no, no, thank you. That, that is a good answer. I agree that indeed semantics are like long, long term, or just kind of some human intuition is much more complex than, than low level control, or like more promising, not complex uh, for, for, for RL. Yeah, you know, no, I just, I would just uh, like to hear, you know, everyone's opinion on like, what, if, if you can choose one task to throw RL forces at for, for space exploration on planetary, what that would be. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question for Salah. This is a bit of a change in the theme. Uh, what are the prospects of robotics projects for space research or science in Australia? 
I guess that has to do with the space agency having formed. Um. I mean, there's a few things that Australia has for it. Um, if you go to Western Australia, we've got like 5 billion year old um, fossilized rocks where a lot of NASA guys go out there and do some uh, astrobiology prelim work and, and try and understand what's going on there. And in that type of terrain, uh, if you coupled that with robotics and also the relationship between scientific exploration and the robots, you could probably do a lot in terms of advancing the research and the activity um, very quickly. Uh, because there's that concentration of activity there. And I think uh, from a space agency perspective, there's there's elements there that are under discussion. Um, also, there's a lot of technology in general in terms of supportive roles for any of the future space missions that we think Australia can, can provide. Um, I think the other aspect is that we're very familiar with robotics in operations, um, complex op operations over you know many months, uh, years. And, and so the aspects of how um, you, you not just look at a robot, but how it fits within the context of operations is important. Um, but it's more specific on the research side. Uh, it's a large land mass, uh, limited communication systems, uh, the need to uh, build powerful real-time machine learning systems and control algorithms, uh, planning algorithms that have to work in real time with low computational processing capability, no comms, uh, so it has to work on board. I mean, all those things provide an opportunity where it's, you don't need to just do it for research for space. It, it has to happen naturally for many other industries that we do here, including space. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question is for the panelists. Um, it's on Slido and it was posted earlier, but uh, we didn't really talk about it. What are some of the most relevant terrestrial applications and companies that will benefit mobility in space. Uh, so anyone, anyone who would like to uh, talk about that, please uh, go ahead and meet yourself or put your hand up. The most relevant terrestrial applications and companies that benefit mobility in space. Um, I, I could see a benefit of having better communication um, enabled by satellites uh, and agile satellites uh, helping terrestrial robotics. Um, many of the, uh, the cars that will eventually self-drive on roads um, do need a link to headquarters and often the link breaks if we're completely reliant on 5G or LTE. Um, and having smart satellites being able to establish these communications even for the vital specs uh, would, would be beneficial. Thank you. Any I, I think the so if the question is relating some of how space research technology sort of feeds back to terrestrial applications, or is it the other way around? What terrestrial applications that we have now that can feed out into space? Uh, it's the latter. So, so what we do now in terrestrial applications that we have that we see relevant in space. Um, I, I mean, in in my context, when I look at a, a complex system like a robot, where you have to couple many different technologies together what space offers is a, a very constrained environment. So you're trying to do more and more with less and less. Um, so you, you know, you're trying to do the same AI algorithms or control algorithms or planning algorithms or vision algorithms, but with less computation, less power, um, uh, energy power, less comms, et cetera. Um, and I think from a, um, a research perspective um, and also from a development perspective, it challenges engineers to try and solve that problem in that way which then has a feedback loop to uh, a terrestrial application. So anything that we've done in mining, agriculture, aviation, I mean, defense, I mean, everyone around the table's done work in, in various areas outside of space, can see the relevance. Um, trying to drive the technology to work better with less, I think will have even more benefit back to the terrestrial application world as well as the space world. Okay. Thank you. So I, I have a question for Annie Mesh. So uh, the good thing about organizing uh, this series of workshops is that uh, I, I just uh, sort of, out of necessity was forced to be exposed to a, a wide variety of talks and topics. And yesterday, our opening lecture from Shirley Ho at the Flatiron Institute was about uh, symbolic regression, which uh, on the surface, at least when I just 
uh, listen to her talk and, and Animish's talk very similar in terms of the what what goals they are. So so for example, they apply the the method to discover the the physical laws for n body uh, for 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 like Coulomb interaction or gravitational interaction uh, from n body simulations. Is it, um, is there actually a huge difference in the type of method you use, or there are very strong similarities actually? Animesh? The methods are actually very different. The input output of the game of the of the of the problem is the same. So you have data, and you want a succinct representation, uh, which can be used uh, as an explanation of the data. Uh, in symbolic regression, one way to think about this is you are given operators, but not the equations. Uh, and you have to put the operators together in some sort of jigsaw puzzle to come up with the equation. In our case, we assume that the operators are neural and you are basically going to learn weights. So uh, in one way to think about this can be, it's, uh, symbolic regression is essentially large scale linear regression uh, or nonlinear regression. I do not want to in any manner say that that is a not promising line of work. I think it's just slightly different. Now that said, symbolic regression and the strongholds in symbolic regression, uh, like at UW uh, with Steve Burton, uh, at MIT with Max Tegmark uh, and Shirley's own group, have shown very, very impressive results. Uh, there's this line of work called AI Feynman, uh, which have uh, the same system or the same algorithm without too much tuning, we discover 50 different kinds of worlds. I think the more interesting thing is, can, how do we connect this or these ideas with two important problems in physics? One, how do we do what is called conservation loss? So conservation loss can be maybe momentum or energy or potential or, or any sort of connection. How do we, how do we learn Lagrangians and Hamiltonians? That's one. Two, can we do learning of reasonably complicated differential equations? Uh, so right now the assumption is that the combinations will be linear, but I will provide all of the terms, x squared, x squared, or, or x dot, x dot, dot, so on and so forth. And then it will basically be a linear combination in that space. But what if I don't know all of the features? So mm -hmm. this symbolic regression is very simple, similar to feature, feature learning. When I know all of the features, I just need to figure out what feature combination will work in this setup. Uh, and I'm arguing that, or at least I'm, I believe for now, that uh, it is not clear if we know all of the features or if we need all of the features. Uh, and finally, just as an extension of point number two, more likely than not, so in many cases, you actually have analogous multimodal streams of data. So let's say climate change, where the actual streams of data is numbers. But in many cases, uh, the input is actually abstract. Uh, so abstract and multimodal. In robotics, input is images or point loads. How so the question would be, can you learn a system of even simple equations, let's say blocks colliding or a simple sort of mass spring system, but the input being images. Thank you. Uh, I have a follow on question if no one else wants to ask. Uh, this is too, too interesting for, for me. So for, the, for the bouncing ball uh, example, um, if, you, if you had like a different uh, interaction potentials or or Hooke's law, deviations from the Hooke's law, um, is, is the same, uh, the same method able to to yes as well. Yes. So the, the the only thing is that it's it's okay. Let me put it this way in, in more sort of like cheeky way. Mm -hmm. If you never see a change in a property, you will never discover it is as a property. So it's like if you always live on Earth, you will never discover gravity. Yeah. Uh, of course, people did, but well. Uh, uh, but that's another matter. So in this setup, there is interventions on everything. The assumption is that at least in some part of the data set, you intervene implicitly. Now, you as in the designer, the data is generated in a manner where interventions happen. So if the Hooke's law changed, it's basically changing the mechanism. And uh, the mechanism can change in discrete ways. So for example, it's a spring or a string or maybe a magnetic sort of... Uh, like a, or a gravitational pull kind of model. So that's a discrete model change. And then within a simple, uh, within a single mechanism, you can have change in uh, variations uh, of parameters. So system, system ID. Uh, now you said, what if it was a completely different model? Um, it could be, we haven't tried that to be very honest yet. We did try changing 
the parameters uh, of the system, but not necessarily the equation uh, to discover a completely new physics law. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, are there further questions? Anyone, uh, some final comments about talks in the previous session? Because we are two minutes away to the next session, the final four contributed talks of this workshop. Uh, if uh, there's no parting words, uh, we will have a chance to talk a little bit more after the next four talks. But uh, thank you so much to all our speakers in this session. This was a very stimulating and uh, see you very soon if you're going to stay around. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, hands off to Mark for putting together such a, a wonderful sort of a program and uh, and keeping us all on track for all day. Thank you. And, and it's definitely not just me because I have the whole committee that was helping out and, and I appreciate that a lot. But okay, four more talks. I'm going to I'm going to now go back to the uh, get the YouTube playlist ready. So give me a moment.